Hi, my name is Mark Richards and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. In this lesson number 104, we'll continue an idea I had from lesson 102, and that is to take some of the most frequently asked questions I get about some aspect of software architecture and put it within a particular context. In this particular lesson, number 104, we'll take a look at some of the more common questions I get related to architectural styles. As a matter of fact, the very first question that I usually get is, what is the difference between an architecture style and an architecture pattern? This becomes very, very confusing. As a matter of fact, to add to the confusion, I used to call architecture styles architecture patterns when I was evangelizing those through conferences or writings or trainings. And I would get the question, well, how does microservices differ from CQRS? And I realized the problem. I used to describe an architectural style as more of a higher level pattern than an architectural pattern, which was a lower level pattern. Both used the word pattern. And so consequently, about three years ago, Neil Ford and I started to evangelize the term architecture style to really describe the overarching architecture for a particular application or system. For example, microservices or a modular monolith or microkernel. It could be event-driven or it could even be service-based. These, what I used to call architecture patterns, we now call architecture styles because these form the overarching architecture, the overall structure of our system, even though we can form hybrids from these. Now this is distinguished from an architectural pattern in the sense that the patterns can be used within any of these architecture styles. For example, CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, can be used to solve a particular problem within a certain area of any of these architecture styles. The same thing with the circuit breaker pattern or even the workflow event pattern. Any of these can be applied to any of the architectural styles. As a matter of fact, so can things like, for example, the ambulance pattern or the event forwarding pattern. There's so many patterns of architecture. And now the difference between an architectural pattern and a design pattern is that the architectural patterns do influence some aspect of the structure of our applications in terms of communication, in terms of services, granularity of services, the communication between components or services. All right, another question that I frequently get is this. Where did the architectural style star ratings come from in your book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, and also a lot of your talks and trainings that you do? And as a matter of fact, that was a keen observation that in our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, as a matter of fact, in addition to some of the trainings that I do as well, or talks, um, we do evangelize these star ratings. I'd like to answer this question because uh, this is a very common question about, well, I see that you put five stars here. Well, where did those come from? Uh, these came uh, from about eight years of my friend Neil Ford and I collaborating on the various architectural styles to try to more concretely define these architectural styles, what they were good at, what they were bad at, and take a various set of architectural characteristics and then rate them. As a matter of fact, eight years ago when we started to do this, uh, we really started with a thumbs up, thumbs down, whether it was supported or not supported. But we quickly realized, as we dove deep into these, that that wasn't granular enough, especially when we started to compare architecture styles. So with that, we went to three thumbs up, three thumbs down as a max, and it still wasn't granular enough. So about three years ago, we switched over to star ratings. As a matter of fact, uh, how these evolved were Neil and I would very frequently meet, sometimes weekly or bi-weekly, and really talk, take a look at very specific architectural characteristics and those corresponding ratings. And we would discuss whether it should be three stars or two stars or maybe four. And each of us would have a justification 
for it being two stars or three cars, three stars. And so we would have these discussions, like I said, over the course of about eight years and ended up arriving at these architecture characteristics, or I should say those star ratings. As a matter of fact, uh, we decided that five stars would de designate a particular architecture characteristic that was highly supported in the architecture. In other words, that particular architecture style lended itself extremely well to that particular characteristic. For example, the ones we're looking at here for space-based architecture, and notice elasticity is about what that architecture is. And so it's highly supported, whereas testability, you see, was one star. One star means it's not really supported or it doesn't lend itself to that architecture style. Testability, uh, the ease of and completeness of testing, how it's defined, especially for something like space-based architecture is really hard because the nature of that architecture style is high levels of elasticity, hundreds of thousands of concurrent access and updates. How do you simulate that? It becomes very, very costly and really hard to get that kind of concurrency. Hence, the testability is fairly low. Now, we decided for some of the characteristics that really were neither good nor bad uh, to put those as a three-star rating, just to really show uh, the relative dimensions of the one and the five stars, what it's really good at and what it's really not so good at. And so they really did evolve uh, through a lot of analysis and collaboration and joint experience uh, between Neil Ford and myself. So speaking of star ratings, one of the most common questions I get when I talk about microservices is, why does microservices only get a two-star rating for performance? And it's kind of interesting. When we take a look at the microservices architecture style, uh, we specifically rated performance as only two stars. Notice five stars for things like elasticity, evolutionary aspects, modularity, overall scalability, but only two stars for performance. Why? Well, this kind of comes as a surprise to most people, either reading our book or uh, coming across these star ratings. And so I thought I would address this specifically um, because it is the most common question I do get <laughs> regarding star ratings. <laughs> it's because of a couple of things, but primarily because of the shape of microservices, that single purpose functions deployed as separate units of software necessarily, uh, these services generally need to communicate with each other. Now, about 10%, I would say, out there of all microservices systems or applications may not need this much collaboration between the services, but 90% which are a majority of the business applications that are implemented in microservices, do need communication between services. Uh, whether it be request-based, in other words, I'm pulling off a lot of information that's in a bunch of separate services, or I've got a process like registering a customer, which may involve four to five, maybe even six microservices to work in conjunction to satisfy that business process. And so this is fairly common to have inter-service or east-west communication between microservices. This is why microservices gets two-star ratings for performance. And let me show you three aspects. The first is network latency. When I communicate to a service, that necessarily is a remote service. And network latency can vary, vary between a couple of milliseconds on a local network uh, to somewhere in upwards of 300 milliseconds um, if it's not local. And so this can vary greatly. And so that's the first aspect that starts chewing down on the performance rating. Um, but the second one is really that of security latency. You may have fast network latency, but the problem is generally we need to secure most of our endpoints within microservices. And when we do secure those endpoints, I incur latency to maybe reauthorize a user for a particular request to a service that I'm communicating with. And this may add anywhere from two to four, maybe even 600 milliseconds onto every hop and every request. But there's another aspect of microservices that lends itself towards less performance, and that is what I like to call data latency. In other words, if I want to retrieve all customer info, 
Well, in a monolithic application, maybe there's seven tables. I do a join in one single SQL statement, and that's pretty fast, around 17 milliseconds. But now consider this. That's spread across seven different microservices. Each of those microservices incurs latency retrieving its own data that I then need to aggregate within memory. And so this also adds to that two-star performance rating. And so it's really all three of these together and kind of that shape of microservices that really does it lend itself towards high performance applications. So for more information, of course, you can go to my website, developer2architect.com, but specifically Software Architecture Monday, which is on the Lessons tab. Uh, this is Lesson 104, which means there's 103 prior lessons out there. I'm sure uh, some of these 10-minute videos that are housed here on my website would intrigue you in some way, shape, or form, but please stay, uh, stay tuned to Software Architecture Monday for more lessons, and I think I will kind of continue. Uh, this FAQ, hence of why I put this as number one, because I did compile quite a big list of architecture style questions that obviously wouldn't fit into this single video. So I will do future ones about some of the other frequent questions I get uh, regarding architecture styles. And so thank you so much for listening. Uh, stay tuned in two weeks for lesson 105 at Software Architecture Monday. Thank you so much.